from the North American International Auto Show. This is Detroit Unspun TV. Since there are two weeks of the auto show, we're giving you two weeks of programming and we've got a busy show in store for you with information on the electric vehicle concept from BMW. More information on what it takes to become a product specialist and of course, this week's Dig Downtown 5. This week's headlines, we learned from Crane's Detroit business that for every $1 the state invests in art and culture institutions, the metro Detroit area gets $51 in economic benefit. We also learned from Model D Media that Cornerstone Bistro is a great place to grab lunch in Highland Park, but it's also a great place because they're training homeless people in restaurant skills so that they can have their own jobs. And we also dove into the topic on our own blog about the Wayne State Warriors donating more time in community service than do the athletes at the University of Michigan or the Ohio State University. And from our oops, our bads files, we've get, we owe a huge apology to the team at CODA. We meant to say Thomas Hausch last week, and we appreciate the opportunity to correct that. Now for our first story today, you want to learn a little about bit about how to create a sustainable business? Wondering what the triple bottom line means? This next piece is right up your alley. As it turns out, doing good by the environment usually ends up being good for you too. A great example is when you buy an energy efficient vehicle, you're going to save money at the gas pump. Turns out, same thing applies for businesses. There's something called the Southeast Michigan Sustainable Business Forum. It's a coalition of companies in the Southeast Michigan area that are committed to helping the environment and their triple bottom line. The president, Daniel Jacobs, is gonna talk more about the program and explain how they're helping our environment and keeping our economy vibrant at the same time. So if you could please tell us, what is the goal of the Sustainability Forum and what is its purpose? The Southeastern Michigan Sustainable Business Forum was founded about 10 years ago. Its original founders were a group of um, both uh, governmental agencies and some of our larger industry uh, businesses in the area, particularly the, the big three, as well as some of the tier one companies that support them. They were all trying to kind of investigate what it was to be sustainable at that time and how they could, as businesses, uh, reduce their operating costs and also uh, deal with the triple bottom line, dealing also with the environment and uh, the social issues. Can you give me a little bit more of an explanation of what this triple bottom line means for a business? Sure, the triple bottom line was a, uh, is a term that was uh, developed by Mc, uh, Bill McDonough and it refers to the people, planet, and profit and trying to make sure that all three of those things are in alignment so that they all work together. Uh, if we're uh, trying to save the planet, we also need to make sure that we are saving the people, dealing with social issues, and at the bottom line, we also still want to make sure that as businesses, that we're also still profitable at the end of the day. Uh, if, if we don't, then we haven't been sustainable for them uh, on a business standpoint, as well as a sustainable for the environment. So all three in alignment, people, planet, profit. How do you see sustainability helping the success of the Southeast Michigan area? Sure. The, the thing that's probably the biggest and that most people typically are going to is, is the energy side of things and how they can reduce down their operating costs. Those can also come in the form of waste reduction as well as energy costs. And well, the other thing that has been studied and actually proven on one of our companies here in Michigan, um, over on the west side, one of the furniture companies actually was able to show that increased productivity from creating environments that are more friendly to work workers. So you have a whole series of things that affect the bottom line of a core organization. I think we often see sustainability in our first fear is, is that that's a, we're tree hugging and we're not going to, it's going to be going to cost us the, uh, money instead of it actually saving us money. And what we find is, is that we can actually do both things. And so it's just uh, trying to help businesses understand how that model works. 
Can you give us an example of some of your existing current members so we have an idea of, of who's participating at this time? Sure. The, the original members were uh, the big three again, and so we had a lot of the very large corporations, Masco, Ford, GM, um, a number of the universities, University of Michigan, University of Dearborn, um, and so we, we had those larger institutional and business clients. Uh, we still have the institutional clients, the universities are still involved with us, but we're more mid-sized and small service uh, businesses now, so really the type of businesses that uh, can benefit from this sort of thing, but may not have the time on their own to go out and do the research and, and develop the knowledge base that they want. The larger companies have people now who are their environmental sustainability coordinators, so they're, they're getting it and they're integrating that. It's part of their practice. The Fortune 500 companies, um, over 80% of them all have that now built into their business model. The smaller, mid-sized guys are the people who really need to benefit from this and they just don't have the resources. So being involved in an organization like ours gives them the ask, access to that knowledge base and a form, a way of learning on a monthly basis. Okay, so how do some of these mid-sized companies get involved? What's the best way for a business to get involved with the forum? Well, the, the, the best thing, of course, is just to start attending our, our, our meetings. And we do that on a monthly basis. We meet on the third Thursday of every month. Um, you can go to our website, which is smsbf.org, and you can actually go there to our, our events um, area and sign up to attend one of the sessions. Uh, I think we, we currently are forecasting out about six months so people can see the kinds of events that are going to be on and who the speakers are. Uh, we try and diversify it. We've got, again, because a range of people from the service sector as well as actual uh, business producing products, and so we try and mix the type of um, talks that we have from uh, sustainability assessing uh, to actual uh, waste stream management and to energy production in different forms. So you can learn a little bit about a whole range of things from those sessions. And then annually we have an, um, a couple of forums that are uh, much larger and much more diverse that people can attend as well. From the Green Garage in Midtown Detroit, this is Natalia Petrozek reporting. Back to you, Dave. As you're touring the auto show, you'll notice there are a lot of pretty handsome people next to a lot of really sexy cars. But it's more than just a pretty face that's standing next to the cars telling you what's going on. They've actually had quite a bit of training as to what is really going on inside the car. Here's a look at just a little bit of what it takes to become a product specialist at an auto show. So we're here with Mary from Productions Plus to talk a little bit about what the product specialists are like. There's a lot more to standing up next to a car and, and telling the world about what that is than just standing up there and looking pretty. There's actually quite a bit of knowledge that goes into being on that stage. So Mary's got quite a bit of background in it. Thanks for joining us today. You're welcome. My pleasure. You have been yourself a product specialist for quite a while, for 10 years. Well, yes, for, for Toyota I was a product specialist for 10 years. I also not only was a product specialist, but I also did some of the facilitation of their training. Uh, these product specialists that we have and here at the Detroit Auto Show, we have over 150 product specialists that we manage through Productions Plus, the talent shop, but um, they go through a grueling training, it's rather intense training, that we work along with the OEMs, with the manufacturers, to bring that knowledge to them. It's typically anywhere between three and five days of intensive training, around the clock, where they learn about the vehicles, get inside the vehicles, learn the nitty-gritty, and a lot of times we'll be able to take them on the open road to get a real perspective of what these vehicles actually do. Now, when did that start to change to from just being that model next to a car to actually being a specialist and actually having to know a lot more of what's under the hood? Well, you know, Marjorie Kresge, the owner of Production Plus, she really started the forefront of these models, as you say, being not just a pretty face. She was here and just talked to a woman and found out that these girls really wanted to know this knowledge and why not merge the two. So you have these very attractive people who are incredibly intelligent as well and not, not only look good, but have the information that they convey to the public, which is what the public really wants. Now, when you were a product specialist, what was that experience like? Now, why did you decide to do it? And was it fun? I mean, what did you? What kind of things did you learn? Well, I learned a lot. I learned a lot about first off the vehicles and um, and in terms of you know just 
the manufacturers and how they work and how they operate, but I also got a chance to travel the country and see many different perspectives of the country and people and how they act and interact. And one of my favorite cities right here in Detroit as well, and be able to do this. This is my 11th uh, Detroit Auto Show, which I'm very excited about. Very cool, and welcome home, by the way. Thank you, thank you very much. So, uh, what's, I guess, what's the need? Uh, if somebody was taking a look or, or at, at doing this as a, as, as a job or career, what kind of things, do, what do you need to know to get started doing this? Well, some of the things you need to know is just know a little bit about the vehicles, have an excitement and passion a little bit about uh, cars, as well as some public speaking does really help because you need to be able to convey those thoughts and ideas that the, the message that the manufacturers do want across to the consumer. And what's the, just the most interesting thing you ever learned about a car? I know I'm asking the you. The most interesting thing that I ever learned about a car, to be honest, when uh, first time that hybrids were developed and introduced were in the 70s, which I thought was pretty interesting. Um, and electric cars came way back in the 1920s, you know, they were really honestly the very first vehicle out there, which I always thought was pretty, pretty cool, and it's coming back around. It's a cool What's old is new again. Exactly. Well, thanks for joining us. Mary. My pleasure. In the automotive industry, being green is a lot more than just having the right engine in the car. Sometimes it means changing out a few things in the interior. And you might be surprised about what you're sitting on the next time you hop into a brand new Ford vehicle. All right, I'm here from, with Carol from Ford, and we're gonna talk a little bit about something a little bit different. Um, apparently, Ford's got a whole new thing going on with their yard but it's a whole different kind of yarn. Why don't you tell us a little bit more about it? Uh, we're currently using the Reprieve yarn on our Focus Electric, and what this is is a post-consumer and post-industrial hybrid yarn that we're using. Uh, for this first model that we had, which is a uh, gasless vehicle, uh, we wanted to do something special, so we created this fabric with one of our other partners, which is Sage Automotive Interiors. And we partnered with them and with Unify to create the fabric in our vehicle for this Focus Electric. That's excellent. That's excellent. So, you know, with things that are recycled, like sometimes people get this idea that maybe they might be sacrificing something in quality or in choice. From what I understand, they're not really. Is how many how many different kinds do we have here? We have in uh, Ford's lineup. We have 37 different fabrics that have recycled content in them, and that goes across uh, trucks, SUVs, and cars. And this started back in 2009 model year and we gave a mandate to all our suppliers that we wanted to have recycled content and it had to be a minimum of 25%. So uh, we've taken that and brought it to all our vehicles and then we're expanding more and more, doing more things with recycled content because there's really no limitations as far as color, texture, hand, design. Recycled yarns. Excellent. So finally, what was the impetus behind this? What what was what was the reason to go recycle and go green with your interiors? That's part of our corporate strategy. Um, sustainability is one of the, the pillars, and so we decided that we were going to go ahead and, and produce more and more materials that would go on the interior that we need. All right. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Thank you. So we know that you're coming down for the North American International Auto Show this weekend, especially since it's the last weekend of the show. But there's a lot more to do downtown. Here are five suggestions for things you might want to check out this weekend. This weekend marks the end of the North American International Auto Show, and by all accounts, this has been the best year for attendance since 2007. That means that several of you are going to be back downtown this weekend looking for different things to do to extend your leisure time in the city. It's a pretty good thing we put together this little video for you each week, isn't it? Without further ado, here's this week's Dig Downtown 5. Number one, the Hungry Dude's Happy Hour. The Hungry Dudes and One Dudette are always finding new ways to test their gastronomic acumen. This week, they share the opportunity with you to join them at the Rattlesnake for a happy hour your stomach won't soon forget. Number two, the AI 
GA Pinewood Derby. Now, in case you weren't in Cub Scouts, the Pinewood Derby is a chance to make cars out of blocks of pine wood, slap four wheels on it, and race it on a short indoor track. Now, instead of a bunch of eight-year-olds doing this, adults are going to have the shot at creating their own cars with proceeds going to the AIGA Detroit's mentoring programs. Number three, Invincible. Now, if you like your hip-hop on the political tip, you're really going to appreciate Invincible. We just wish our emails and our videos would flow the way words seem to flow out of Invincible's mouth. Number four, Hot to Death, Birthday Edition. The party is always, well, hot when these two anti-DJs grace the stage. Prepare for the best in post-punk, new wave, and electronica this weekend. And number five, Masters of the Universe 2. Now mind you, this version of it has nothing to do with the Sweet Kids cartoon from the 80s. This version is an incredible lineup of Detroit and Chicago electronic music DJs. And their tagline says it all, dress to sweat. This event is gonna be hot. From outside the Pure Michigan booth at the North American International Auto Show, that's this week's Dig Downtown 5. So in addition to all the production vehicles that are here, there's also a lot of innovation that's happening on campuses around the area. We had the chance to talk with an engineering student from Oakland University about what their student racing team is doing to innovate the next generation of cars. I'm here with Tom Garvey, a junior at Oakland. Go Grizzlies. Yes. Uh, and it's interesting, you've got these cars that, that you're showing here at the International Auto Show, and it's not so much because Oakland's in the business of selling cars, but it's to highlight some of the things that you're doing with your Formula SAE program, yes. correct? Can you tell us a little bit about the cars and, and what your experience has been with it? Sure. Uh, Formula SAE is a competition, a collegiate competition against colleges worldwide. Um, we get a year to build a car from the ground up. We start with designing, and then... Uh, we moved to building bending tubes and then start making body work and uh, doing testing. And then we have our competition in May. So you're really getting that hands-on experience working directly to create from the ground up a vehicle yes. yourself. What, um, I, I guess, how has that experience helped shape your thinking about what your major is at Oakland? Um, well, it's basically just out of classroom experience. It's, this is strictly extracurricular at Oakland, and so we're, I'm doing everything that I've been doing in the real world. Very cool. Yeah. Now, since you're here during the media preview days, have yep. you had a lot of media stop by? And if you have, what have they been saying? What kinds of questions are they asking you? Um, I didn't work yesterday, so I'm really not too sure, but I know we had quite a few to stop by, and we had another interview on TV. And, I'm not sure what they've been really asking, but I'm assuming pretty much the same as what you've been asking. <laughs> <laughs> well, what's your experience been like here at the auto show so far? I know oh, it's, it's early, but... Oh, it's been great. Talking to a lot of different people, you know people, trying to get more sponsors or connections out there from OU, or more people to come to OU. Great. Well, thanks, Tom. We appreciate hey, thank it. Thank you. Appreciate your time. One of the things you told us on Twitter was you wanted to learn more about the electric vehicle concepts that were coming up. Luckily, BMW's got a concept right behind them, and we had a chance to ask several questions about what makes their product different from everybody else's. So we're here with Jose Guerrero from BMW. He is the North American manager for the electronic vehicles. If I've got his title correctly, so it seems like you're the guy to talk to about this stuff. Yes. Why is it important for BMW to be showing off the electronic vehicles at this particular auto show? For us, the ability to be in the market, especially in Detroit, to show the i3 at the concept form and to show the technology as far as our commitment to electromobility, this is why we wanted to be here today. And what makes 
the BMW concept a little bit different from every from every, because it seems like everybody has a concept like this here. What what makes BMW stand out a little bit more from the rest? So from our Project I or our BMW i3 and our BMW i8, uh, it's it's based upon the production concept of using carbon fiber. This for us in a mass scale is how we want to reduce the overall vehicle weight. This is something that is unique to BMW that we enter full series production with uh, carbon fiber and this is our key element. And I'm sure the vehicle weight, if you can lessen the vehicle weight, you can actually get a better range out of the battery. Is, is that correct? Yes, that's, that's exactly the point of it. And the, with our batteries, what we're able to do is even use less of uh, the traditional battery from, let's say, a typical converted vehicle, right? So something that's just, let's say, a vehicle that's in production now, they have to put more batteries in it just so they could get the typical range of, uh, of uh, EV customer. Now, a vehicle like this, obviously it's a concept, it's not going to be in production anytime soon, but what are some of the things that you've been able to adapt right away into some of the vehicles based on the research that's been done for these particular models? Well, for actually for, for the BMW i3 concept, we're planning to go into uh, the market in 2013. Oh, great. So this, the way you, you guys are seeing this, it's going to be very close to what's going to be out there uh, for the public to actually purchase. And uh, from our standpoint, we have an ability right now to see what an EV customer is using. Uh, right now, we're, we're going to start delivery shortly with the Active E, which uses the drivetrain uh, and the power electronics of the i3. Um, so we're getting the test bed or the, the test experiences now so that we can use that, that lessons learned and apply it to the i3. And in this particular uh, uh, i3 vehicle, we're looking at the battery technology, we're looking at the connected drive and the connected services, as well as the overall durability of uh, electric vehicle and the carbon fiber uh, combination. So we're really excited. Great. Well, thank you very much for your time today. Thank you. For this week's Detroit People, our own Ashley Hennon had the chance to catch up with a student from College for Creative Studies who won an award from Michelin for his design of a Jeep Wrangler. Um, I was always interested in cars and drawing. I thought the closest thing you could get to drawing cars was architecture. I really didn't have a clue until someone one day, I, I wish I remembered who it was because I'd go thank that person told me that there's an actual major that you can do that. and. Uh, that, that struck me in awe and I just focused on that was what I was going to do. So, My dad um, built cars for 30 years. He worked for Jeep building Wranglers and so he instilled that passion in me and then I could just, naturally I was born able to draw so I kind of put the two together. It starts with a lot of internet, just research. I sit there for hours and look at, you know, photographs and fashion and shoes and anything and everything just to get you know inspiration you know your brain can take in so much and you might not remember something but it'll come out in your drawing sometimes so then you'll kind of move on to a, just a blank sheet of paper and a pencil and start sketching it's funny because I just I just listened to I think it was the head of Lincoln design speak last week and he's talked about how car designers were always influenced by fashion and by fashion I mean uh, the way clothes flow on people um, you know, trends that are in the market, in that fashion market, and it was, for a long time, it was setting the standard of kind of where car design was going, where people were getting influenced by these organic shapes that they were seeing in fashion. Where now, cars went through this retro phase in the past couple of years where you see a Mustang looking like a 60s Mustang, or a Challenger looking like a 70s Challenger. And he made a remark about how um, fashion now is kind of following car design because now they're going retro. So he said for once, car design is actually ahead of fashion for the first time in a long time. So I thought that was funny. Um, so you'll do phases of sketching, refinement. You'll kind of move from um, mechanical sketching into the computer. And you'll start you know, rendering and applying color. And then from there, you'll pick a design direction and build a model of it. So. 
it's, it's, it's a lot of fun. And it's, a, it's a long process, but it keeps you entertained the whole time. Um, what I have at the auto show is a quarter scale model of a 2020 Wrangler concept I worked on for Jeep. And then also the images from the Michelin Design Challenge that one was there um, this year. So that was exciting. It was a cool, cool feeling to be able to stand back and watch people's reactions to your work. You're kind of like a fly on the wall, and you're able to sit there and really get a feel for how people think. I mean, I've been coming since I was probably four years old, so I, I typically come every year and um, give it a once-over, but this year was special because I had work there, and um, I was able to go. This was my sixth time last night. <laughs> I think they they push you a lot, and you know I'm a driven person, so I like that they they challenge the limits, and you know they'll tell you when you're in the sketching phase, 50 pages of sketches, and that's like I don't know how I'm going to get that done in one week. And then you come in, and the next week it's 60 pages of sketches, and they they keep pushing your limits, and it, it drives you to be a better person and a better designer. So I think work ethic is something that defines a person. So. I think you know it's a value that they kind of they break you down and bring you back up. So, it's fun. We hope that you've enjoyed the last half hour of Detroit Unspun TV. As always, there are a ton of people to thank. City Year, thank you for giving me this sweet shirt over Christmas. Ashley, Natalie, thanks for your contributions, but most of all, thank you for watching. Buena suerte, Detroit. <laughs>